Melbourne's Westgate Bridge carries more than 200,000 vehicles every single day, making it one of the most congested pieces of road in Australia. For decades, this bridge has been the only viable route connecting the city centre with the rapidly expanding western suburbs. So, when the Victorian government announced plans for a massive tunnel project to relieve this pressure, it seemed like the solution everyone had been waiting for. But, what started as a $5.5 billion infrastructure promise turned into a $12 billion nightmare involving toxic soil and backdoor corporate deals. This is the story of how Australia's most ambitious tunnel project became its most controversial. Every morning, thousands of Melbourne commuters face the same frustrating reality. The Westgate Bridge, opened in 1978, was designed for a different era. Today it operates at absolute maximum capacity, and a single fender bender can create gridlock that paralyzes entire neighborhoods for hours. The bridge has become a critical vulnerability for a major city and everyone knew something had to change. Back in 2014, Labor promised voters a modest solution called the Westgate Distributor, with an estimated cost of $680 million. It would be a straightforward project to ease some of the pressure, but after Labor won the election, that plan vanished. Instead, in April 2015, the government unveiled something completely different. The new proposal was massive, ambitious, and carried a price tag eight times higher than what voters had been promised. Here's where things get interesting. This wasn't a project that came from standard government planning or a public tender process. Transurban, the toll road giant that already controlled CityLink and other Melbourne toll roads, walked into government offices with an unsolicited proposal. They presented a ready-made plan for twin tunnels, elevated roads, and a complete traffic overhaul. The government didn't shop around or compare options. They simply said yes. The project remained completely secret through the entire 2014 election campaign. Voters went to the polls believing they would get a $680 million distributor road. Instead, they got a $5.5 billion tunnel mega project that nobody had voted for. Critics immediately called it a bait and switch and accused the government of deliberately hiding the real plan until after the election was safely won. The Westgate tunnel deal was negotiated behind closed doors, with no competitive process to ensure taxpayers were getting value for money. This wasn't how major infrastructure decisions were supposed to work, and it set the stage for everything that would go wrong later. And before anyone could properly scrutinize the deal, Transurban and the government were already moving forward, promising that construction would begin soon and that Melbourne's traffic nightmare would finally end. Little did anyone know that the financial arrangements behind this project would make the initial price tag look like pocket change compared to what Transurban would ultimately take home. To get Transurban to help fund the tunnel, the Victorian government offered them something extraordinarily valuable, an extension on their CityLink toll contract. CityLink was originally supposed to stop charging tolls in 2035, returning the road to public ownership after Transurban had recovered their investment plus profit. Instead, the government extended that deadline by at least 10 to 15 years, pushing it to 2045 or beyond. The numbers are staggering. Analysis shows that by 2044 to 2045, Transurban stands to collect an additional $37 billion in nominal terms from this deal. Even more surprisingly, the extension of the existing CityLink tolls will generate more revenue for the company than the actual Westgate tunnel tolls themselves. The new tunnel tolls are valued at nearly $11 billion by 2044 to 2045, but the real gold mine is keeping CityLink tolled for that extra decade. Opposition politicians immediately question the math. One asks the obvious question, who does a deal where a private company puts in $4 billion and gets $37 billion back? The Victorian Auditor General launched an investigation and delivered a scathing report. The findings showed that the government had approved the project without sufficient evidence that it provided value for money, or that Transurban's proposal had the unique qualities required to justify skipping a competitive tender. The controversy deepened when it emerged that Victorian Treasurer Tim Pallas, who signed off on the deal, was actually a Transurban shareholder at the time. While there's no suggestion of illegal activity, the optics were terrible. The person responsible for protecting taxpayer interests in negotiations had a direct financial stake in Transurban's success. 
And while everyone argued over profit and legal contracts, Transurban's team was already at work preparing to dig. However, they had no idea they were about to face their biggest challenge yet. Two massive tunnel boring machines arrived in Melbourne with appropriately grand names, Bella and Vigida. These weren't ordinary construction equipment. Each machine measured 15.6 meters in diameter, stood as tall as a five-story building, stretched 90 meters long, and weighed 4,000 tons. They were the largest TBMs ever deployed in the Southern Hemisphere, and they needed to be. The tunnels would dive 35 meters below the surface, cutting through soft clays, silty earth, and hard basalt rock while staying below the water table. The cutting head on each machine spun with 68,291 kilonewton meters of torque, powered by an 8,400 kilowatt system. Inside these mechanical beasts, crews of up to 20 people worked in shifts around the clock. Because they operated so deep and under such pressure, workers needed special training in hyperbaric chambers, learning techniques normally used by deep sea divers. The tunnels weren't just holes in the ground. As Bella and Vita advanced, they simultaneously constructed permanent tunnel walls using massive curved concrete segments. A dedicated factory was built in Benalla specifically to produce these segments. The $60 million facility created hundreds of regional jobs and manufactured over 28,000 individual pieces. Engineers designed each segment to be 2.4 meters long, among the longest ever used globally which meant fewer pieces to install and faster construction. Getting these segments from factory to construction site required careful logistics. A new 700-meter rail siding was built so most pieces could travel by freight train rather than clogging highways with truck convoys. But some components were simply too large for trains, around 460 pieces weighing up to 160 tons each needed special treatment. Superload trucks measuring 52 meters long transported these giants through regional towns in the middle of the night, crawling along at just 25 kilometers per hour. Local police had to escort these massive loads, and traffic lights were sometimes removed temporarily to let them pass. Everything was planned with precision. Engineers had calculated the geology, planned the logistics, and designed every detail. But one thing they had not accounted for was the poisonous soil that they would unearth from the tunnel. In June 2019, routine groundwater testing delivered results that nobody wanted to see. The soil along the tunnel route was contaminated with PFAS, the so-called forever chemicals that don't break down in the environment or the human body. This wasn't minor contamination. Soil samples showed levels between 112 and 2,000 times the acceptable limit for drinking water. The project needed to excavate 1.5 million cubic meters of earth, enough to fill the entire Melbourne cricket ground. And suddenly all of it was classified as toxic waste. Victoria had no landfill approved or equipped to handle this volume of contaminated material. The discovery didn't just slow construction. It brought everything to a complete halt. Bella and Vita, those massive tunnel boring machines, sat idle underground, while lawyers argued about who would pay for the cleanup the builders, the government, and Transurban, all pointed fingers at each other. And when they realized that the problem was too huge to go public, they quietly continued with the project without the public's approval. The Victorian Ombudsman launched an investigation into how the Environmental Protection Authority handled the crisis. The resulting report was devastating. It found that the EPA came under immense pressure to fix the problem quickly and get construction moving again. Under this pressure, the agency created special regulations specifically for the Westgate Tunnel Project. These bespoke rules bypass normal community consultation processes and remove review rights for residents living near the three proposed disposal sites at Bulla, Bacchus Marsh, and Ravenhall. Communities only discovered they would be living next to massive toxic dumping sites when media reports broke the story. Transurban's right to toll motorists on CityLink for an extra decade is on the line if it can't get on with building the Westgate Tunnel. Premier Daniel Andrews made the threat as his government scrambles to deal with toxic soil. There had been no proper notification, no community meetings, and no chance for residents to voice concerns about health impacts. The Ombudsman found that the EPA had failed to give specific consideration to human rights of these communities who were understandably terrified about millions of tons of contaminated soil arriving in their neighborhoods.
the contaminated soil crisis alone added $3.3 billion to the project cost and pushed completion back three full years from 2022 to 2025. What started as an engineering challenge had become a toxic nightmare with legal, environmental, and political dimensions that threatened to bury the entire project. With billions of dollars on the line and the project hemorrhaging money every day, something had to give. The question was, who would blink first? By January 20th, 20, the situation had reached a breaking point. The contractors building the tunnel, led by a joint venture including John Holland and CPB contractors, declared force majeure. They argued the contaminated soil was an unforeseen circumstance beyond their control, and they threatened to terminate the contract entirely. If that happened, the partially built tunnel would sit abandoned, a $5 billion hole in the ground with nothing to show for it. Premier Daniel Andrews responded publicly, accusing Transurban and the contractors of playing silly games to extract more taxpayer money. He insisted the contamination issue was a problem for the builders to solve, not the state. Transurban rushed to the Supreme Court, seeking an injunction to stop the contractors from walking away. The legal battle was fierce, with arbitration proceedings grinding on for months while the clock ticked and costs mounted. Behind closed doors, desperate negotiations were taking place. Everyone involved knew that abandoning the project would be a disaster. The political fallout would be catastrophic, the sunk costs unrecoverable, and Melbourne would still have its gridlock problem. Someone had to compromise, and everyone had to pay. The settlement finally reached in late 2020 was painful for all parties. Victorian taxpayers were forced to contribute an additional $1.9 billion beyond what had already been committed. Transurban had to reach into its own pockets for $2.2 billion more. The construction companies had to forfeit $1 billion in expected revenue and profit, essentially working at cost to finish what they'd started. The final price tag exploded from the original $5.5 billion estimate to somewhere between $10 and $12 billion, depending on how costs are calculated. With money finally flowing again, construction resumed. Bella and Vita started moving once more, chewing through rock and clay to complete their journeys. The contaminated soil was transported to the three designated disposal sites, though community opposition never fully subsided. Above ground, the elevated roadway took shape, with the launching gantry crane methodically assembling the sky road piece by piece. By early October 2025, major milestones had started falling. Premier Jacinta Allen personally test drove the completed elevated Footscray Road section, which now stretches 1.5 kilometers through the air. Inside the tunnels, workers were installing over 10,000 architectural panels and fitting out advanced safety systems. The twin tunnels are connected by 31 emergency passages, allowing evacuations if anything goes wrong. Asphalting of the nearly seven kilometers of underground roadway was scheduled for late 2025. The project is now targeting a December 2025 opening. One of Melbourne's major roads is just months away. Despite repeated delays, it's scheduled to open up in December. With a promotional period of free weekend tolls planned for January 2026, to encourage drivers to try the new route. After years of delays, disasters, and disputes, the Westgate Tunnel is finally approaching the finish line. The Westgate Tunnel stands as both an engineering triumph and a cautionary tale. It proves that Australia can build world-class infrastructure, but it also exposes how badly things can go wrong when projects are rushed, tests aren't properly conducted, and communities are left out of decisions that affect their lives. So. What do you think about the Westgate Tunnel Saga? Was the $12 billion price tag worth it for Melbourne? Or did taxpayers get a raw deal? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you found this story as wild as we did, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more deep dives into the world's most controversial mega projects. Until next time, stay curious,